All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Itai Shakuri. I lead the open source team at Aqua Security. Um, I was supposed to give this talk together with my colleague, uh, Jose, but he got uh, stuck in the storm. So um, Jose was an uh, inevitable part of this presentation, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. Um, so we're going to talk today about something you probably haven't heard yet in this conference, which is supply chain security. Yeah, uh, but I hope it will be a refreshing uh, one for you because uh, we want to see if we can take um, concepts or principles from the runtime security practice, which we have some experience in, and apply those into the uh, build time. Specifically, when I say um, runtime security experience, I'm referring to our uh, open source project that is called Tracy. I don't know if you heard about it, so I need to just set the level. Um, Tracy uses uh, eBPF to tap into your system and give you access to hundreds of events that unveil how your system actually behaves. Uh, moreover, it uh, can help you detect suspicious uh, behavioral patterns in those events, um, either using a library of built-in signatures that we ship with, uh, with Tracy, or you can write your own. Uh, we call them behavioral signatures based on the uh, event stream that we generate. That's Tracy, it's open source, go check it out on GitHub, just to make sure uh, when I say Tracy, you know what I mean. All right, so um, I said we wanna see if we can take random security concepts like Tracy and apply them in the build time. Uh, to explain the motivation for that, I need to take you back a little bit, just a couple of years ago. Um, different times, in cloud native times, you know, a lot have happened in two years. Very early uh, days for uh, the supply chain security um, category. Um, before all the S-bomb craze, before the executive order, before tools and standards that didn't exist, so early days, um, so meaningful attacks that happened and opened the, uh, our eyes and everyone else to look into this stuff. Uh, specifically for us, it was the CodeCov uh, breach. I don't know if you, anyone here remembers that, but uh, basically it targeted GitHub Actions users by, um, so the attackers were able to compromise a very popular GitHub Action, CodeCov, a, a code coverage uh, scanning tool, and through the upstream of that upstream, they were able to actually compromise you or your build. Um, so classic supply chain uh, attack, and it made us and others think, think what we can do to, uh, to protect against that. At that time, we still had uh, Tracy open sourced for a while. Tracy was open sourced in uh, 2019. So we thought, why not? Why not just try and use Tracy uh, in the pipeline? Um, I was actually a little bit skeptical, like, can we run eBPF in a managed service like GitHub? So apparently, yes, they don't care at all. And Tracy just uh, ran. We wrapped it in a GitHub action. That was the first incarnation of uh, the Tracy action. We just wrapped it in a GitHub action. You add it to your pipeline. It starts running in the background. Um, it, uh, look, it is looking for any of the suspicious behavioral patterns that I am uh, indicating. And uh, it worked. It was a, a very um, nice first step. Uh, but first lesson that we learned uh, is that the build time is not the same as production. Uh, specifically, uh, Tracy had uh, back then a limited set of signatures that we shipped it with, and uh, they were very tailored to production. So. Um, for example, uh, one of the signatures looked for, um, let's take an example, so enforcing uh, immutable infrastructure. This is something that we wanted to do in production. You know, immutable infrastructure, basically you need to pre-bake your containers, ship them to production, you don't need to introduce any new software to production directly. So that signature looked for any new executables 
being introduced uh, in production. A very good, uh, probably best practice to do in, in, in the production, but very bad thing to do in build time because the build server pretty much has only one job, which is to produce new executables. So didn't work out. Um, so we had to fine tune the list, but I think the more important lesson here is that um, we, uh, we could make assumptions in the build time that we could not have made in the, uh, in the production. So Tracy was built with production in mind. All of the signatures had to be very generic and abstract. We didn't want to assume anything about what you are running in production, what tools you are using, what's your tech stack, we don't care. We just want to look from the below, from the underneath, and to see if something suspicious looking for us. Uh, but in the build, we actually can assume some things. Like, I don't know, you're a Go shop. You know which tools you're using. You know your tool chain. You're not going to switch to be a Python shop every other day, right? So we know how the pipeline is going to look, more or less. It's going to be pretty much consistent. So uh, we can leverage that to write more specific signatures. Things that we could not have afforded to do in production, we can do here. For example, um, let's do something specific to a Go build pipeline. Like, um, the Go mode file should never change during the build, right? If you want to change it, change it before. Make a pull request, have someone review it. But it should not change during the build. So we can do specific things like that. And we started to do specific things like that, like to write signatures that look for very specific things. But as you can imagine, it's like a very long list of bad things that can happen. It's going to be very hard to maintain. So then we thought, why don't we do the inverse? Instead of looking for the bad stuff, uh, let's just define what is the good normal behavior of your pipeline and just enforce it. So in other words, we started to do profiling with Tracy. This was the second uh, incarnation of this project. And uh, we introduced a profiling feature to Tracy. You still introduce it the same way to your pipeline. It builds the profile automatically for you. So we ditch the signatures. We build the profile of every um, executable that we en encounter during the, the run. And uh, it's supposed to represent more or less the composition like not a composition, but um, uh, what your pipeline is made of. How does it normally behave? Like, I sometimes think about it like an S-bomb for the runtime or something like that. Maybe that's another talk. But um, we generate a profile. Everything that was executed during the, the, uh, the build, and then you review this. You accept it as the baseline. And then next time it runs again, if we see something else, if we see something that we didn't expect to see, we will let you know. Um, another lesson learned here is that uh, building a profile is not that easy, uh, especially when we consider uh, executions and things like that, because there's a lot of very volatile information involved there um, that, um, that you know that's going to change. Like, for example, if there's a process ID some, somewhere in the profile, right? We're dealing with executions. So probably there's a process ID recorded here and there. You know that it's going to change the next time you run it. So um, it's a very uh, difficult thing to balance between um, collecting enough information to make the profile meaningful, but not too much information uh, to make it annoying. So we had to to go through some iteration to fine tune what we do and what we don't want to include in the profile. And uh, we removed a lot of things from the profile to make it stable. Uh, and we thought that we can compensate on the information that we uh, removed from the profile with signatures that will help balance that. And that brings me to the third incarnation of this uh, project and the current one where we basically take the, both, the best of both worlds. So uh, you still introduce Tracy to the pipeline the same way. There's a GitHub action, you add it to the pipeline, and it runs in the background. Um, it, will, uh, it will 
look for any of the suspicious behavioral patterns using the built-in uh, signatures. Since then, it was greatly uh, expanded, but uh, uh, still the same thing. You can also write your own signatures on top of that. And using that tool, you can find a specific bad behaviors that you want to uh, look for. That's a very good tool. But at the same time, we also build a profile. Uh, we also expanded the profile to include more than executables. We also uh, look for uh, file modifications that happen during the pipeline and network activity that happened during the pipeline. And the profile um, uh, uh, lets you uh, represent the, the normal behavior. So it's kind of like an allow list and deny list approach. The signatures lets you declare what is the bad stuff that you're looking for. The profile lets you declare what is the good stuff that you uh, want to enforce. And you can pick the, the best tool when you want to introduce a new security control, you can pick either. So, um, so that's the, the current version. Let's, let's see before we dive into it, let's see how it looks like. All right. So uh, we have a Go project here. Um, you see a main.go and go mod, and uh, we have a pipeline in GitHub that builds it. So you see the, the normal actions, you see go mod verify, go test, go build, and you can see the Tracy start and stop actions that uh, to do Tracy. You can also see a suspicious uh, action here, fake upload. Right now it's good. It will turn row later on. Uh, so, so far so good. Let's push this uh, project into GitHub. And this is the first commit. So it's the first time um, uh, we are running this workflow in GitHub. And um, the, the GitHub workflow we run, and we will see, soon see that it fails. The reason why it failed is because Tracy failed it. Uh, because it's the first time you run it, there is an unknown profile, you need to acknowledge it. So we created a new pull request. This is the, uh, the, the pull request that uh, asks you to review and commit the profile. You can see here all of the uh, things that we saw that should happen during the, pro the, the pipeline. Uh, this is the DNS profile, execution profile, and files being modified, three files introduced. So we reviewed, everything looks good. We merge this, uh, this pull request. Again, this is not the pull request that we made. This is the pull request that Tracy made. And now we need to go back to our pull request and update it because um, now there's a profile. So we go back to the code. We update main. Let's uh, check out our, uh, our branch and uh, merge it with main. So basically now we update our um, pull request with the, the newly built profile. Go back to, to GitHub, and this is the same pull request that we had in the beginning. Now the pipeline is uh, rerun, and it passed this time because nothing changed from the, prof from the profile that it knows to the current execution. It means that we can merge it safely. Nothing, nothing looks wrong here. All right, so some time passed. Someone working on this project wants to introduce a new feature. So they update main. They would create uh, a branch. Let's call it, uh, this is a new feature. And uh, we have a new branch. It doesn't really matter, so it's gonna be an empty commit. We just want to re-trigger the, the workflow. It doesn't matter which change we make. Because what we want to demonstrate here is that uh, it might be that one of the GitHub actions that we used has been also updated during this time, like happened in the code code breach that we discussed earlier. And let's say now we are the maintainer of that action. Let's say we push the new version of that uh, action um, and we use the same tag uh, and it means that our pipeline will now use this new code automatically. So we go back to our feature and we create a new pull request 
to introduce our cool new feature. This new pull request will trigger the workflow. The workflow will use the, uh, the fake uploader action, which is now uh, have been updated. And you can see that this time, unlike the previous time, this time, this pull request failed. Uh, the, the pipeline failed. Also, we see a comment here from Tracy saying that uh, we saw something suspicious happening during the pipeline, specifically a minor domain, something that looks like a minor uh, in the pipeline. We uh, have all the raw da data here. And also a new pull request was created to show us what is changed, what exactly was changed. So we see that a new process was uh, executed. We see the the, the SHA for it, we see the arguments, and we also see that the file was modified. Main.go was modified during the pipeline. It, it didn't happen before, it shouldn't happen. So we use the pull request here t as a kind of a user interface to show you what is wrong between, uh, what is different between the last time and this time. So that's, that's how it's looking like. Um, and Let's talk a little bit more in depth about what, uh, what we saw and what we had to do in order to make it work. So there's the workflow. And uh, you already saw that the way that we introduced Tracy is using a GitHub action, actually uh, a pair of actions, one to start the trace and one to stop the trace. Um, everything in between will be uh, captured and monitored. Uh, the first challenge that we faced, um, and we're trying to recap like the past couple of years of this project, uh, was that running eBPF um, at least a couple of years ago was not that trivial, um, especially in a remote service or a managed service. Um, and uh, in the beginning, uh, Tracy was uh, basically compiling the eBPF code on the node. This, is, this was the common practice. It still is in some cases. Compiling the eBPF code on the node when it runs. It means that it, it carries a very heavy weight tool, change, uh, tool chain in, in the container of Tracy itself in order to just perform the compilation. But also it means that it needs some dependencies like kernel headers depending on the machine that you're running on. It's a very complicated uh, process. Uh, error prone as well, uh, depending on an external environment that is not up to us, like does the machine have kernel headers available? Is it in the past that we expect it to be in? We're not always sure. So one of the very significant changes that we made was uh, to make the, the, the eBPF uh, portion of Tracy um, Compile once, run everywhere. This is how it's called in the eBPF uh, world. Basically means to make it portable in simple words. Uh, it's simple words, but it's very hard <laughs> to achieve in, in the code. And um, in order to make it happen, again, there are some dependencies on the, on, the, on the machine. Not every Linux kernel supports this in the same way, et cetera. And we had to create like a separate project it's called BTF Hub uh, to, to solve the problem of eBPF portability. But anyway, long story short, it, it works now. And uh, it's, uh, it's one of the first projects to do something like that. So it's now very easy to run Tracy everywhere, including in your pipeline. Another thing that we had to uh, implement here and uh, that we learned the hard way was that uh, when we are tracing stuff, especially for security purposes, um, you need to be very certain that you capture every single event, every single bit. Uh, you can't afford to lose any information. Um, and the way that this orchestration of Tracy in the pipeline worked, um, in the beginning, we were losing some events because Tracy was starting, the pipeline was starting, there was kind of an opportunity there to lose events. What we had to do is to make Tracy block the pipeline until it finished initializing. We had to like introduce this, uh, again, not so trivial feature to Tracy. 
um, in order to block the pipeline until Tracy says, I'm finished, I'm all ready for tracing, and then the pipeline starts running. So there's a minimum delay here, uh, but because uh, we switched from compiling the eBPF code on the node to the compile one run everywhere, it means that Tracy boots much, much faster than it used to. So these two goes hand in hand. Um, what else? So another thing uh, we need to consider here is that there's the GitHub gives you basically a VM to run your code, right? In this VM, uh, there is the workflow itself that uh, that is running, and in order to avoid um, noise from the machine itself, like this is Linux, a lot of things are happening at any given time. I don't know. Uh, a system update might start sometime, and we will see it because Tracy is running uh, in the kernel. So in order to focus Tracy to look only on what's interesting for us, um, we, have, uh, we have this uh, filtering mechanism in Tracy that we can use. It's an old feature. You can tell it exactly what, uh, what to filter on. So for in this example, we identified the way that GitHub sets up the the uh, the runner, and uh, we saw that there is uh, one process. If we trace this process tree, basically this process and everything underneath it, it basically means we're tracing only the, the pipeline. So this was um, not too hard to do, but uh, considering that there are other areas in the uh, machine that we needed to look into as well, started to face some problems. For example, some things will run as Docker containers. These Docker containers will not, will not be under this process tree that, uh, that is basically the, the workflow itself. The workflow would start the container, but the container process itself would appear under the Docker daemon or something like that. So we need visibility into that as well, right? But if we filtered to see only the process tree, it will conflict. Another thing is that sometimes we need visibility into the host itself as generally, because remember we have the generic signatures that we brought from Tracy, from the production kind of use case, then why not use them to look into the host as well? So we have now um, a challenge that we want to trace different scopes for different purposes. For the for the host, I want to see these kind of events. For the workflow, I want to see another set of events, only, th only the things that I need to build a profile, for example. For Docker, I want to see other things that help me detect uh, Docker-specific uh, suspicious behavior. So this was uh, something that we were dragging along for a while, uh, but uh, recently we finally launched a very significant uh, feature in Tracy that we called multiscopes, basically allowing us to, 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 to trace different, uh, to create scopes, basically. A scope is basically a set of filters that are independent of, uh, of uh, one another. So we have, for example, one scope. This is the syntax how it is um, in Tracy. So you tell Tracy to trace, and we create scope number one, this will be just the list of all the signatures that we want to, uh, to observe on the host. So fileless execution is one signature. Hidden file created is another signature. These are the events that you want Tracy to trace. And we don't apply any special filter here except by saying uh, this is one scope. And then there's another scope that says that uh, we want to look for file modification e events. This is uh, a kind of events that Tracy emits. But in this scope number two, where the f file modification event is in, we want to also um, limit the, the file modifications only from uh, the GitHub workspace directory. Basically, where GitHub checks your code into. Otherwise, we will just see all the files that are changed on the host, which is not going to help anyone. The third scope is basically to say, let's look at the, uh, the GitHub runner tree and the Docker tree. 
And in these cases, we want to see uh, the executions and the network activity in order to build the profile. I will show you more about this in a second. But the, the, the point here is that um, uh, scoping the, the trace into different use cases, and for every use case, tracing the, uh, only the, the, the relevant events for that scope is, uh, it was a very, very critical uh, thing to do. All right, so let's uh, look a little bit deeper into what, what Tracy uh, can tell you about every category. Um, executions is one category. In the executions category, there is a bunch of signatures that uh, are introduced just by the nature of Tracy is there. So looking for suspicious things that might happen on the, on the hosts, um, like suspicious executions patterns. Let's pick uh, just one for example, code injection. Some process is trying to inject code to a running, another process running instance, or uh, um, a LD preload, someone is me messing with the dynamic linker, or something like that. So this you get for free like in quotes from just Tracy being there. Uh, in addition, Tracy also builds an execution profile of what happened during the build. What is in this profile? First of all, binary path, like what's the binary that was run? The binary hash, very important to know if this process that is called ls is the same as another process that's called ls. Uh, the user who created it, uh, this was this was uh, there for uh, ages, and uh, it's uh, kind of uh, um, goes without saying. But then we uh, found out another lesson that we were missing by not including the arguments for the process. Uh, just to give an example, let's say you have in your pipeline a curl into codecov.com, uh, and then someone managed to change it to curl into mybedminer.com. It's the same curl, it's the same hash. If you just trace executables, nothing changed, right? All good. But no, just by changing an argument, I dramatically changed the behavior of the pipeline. So we needed to include that information as well, but the problem was that um, a process arguments includes a lot of volatile information. Like for example, when, when you do a git clone or something like that, um, GitHub creates a temporary directory, and that directory name is changed every time you run the pipeline, and that is being passed as an argument. So a lot of volatile information that, we, uh, that would just pollute the profile. So to solve this, we had to introduce another kind of uh, feature that is uh, ignore system that lets you um, basically say, these, these kind of things, I know that they will happen, I want to ignore them. Um, and another kind of blind spot was the environment variables that every process had access to. So we wanted to include that as well, but uh, that created another problem of, uh, so you know, environment variables contain secrets usually, and if we are including that in the profile, we're basically committing your secrets to the source code, not something that we want to do. Now you have the ignore system, so you could ignore these kind of environment variables and say something that is called GitHub token, just don't include it in the profile. That will solve the problem. But just out of um, precaution, we decided to make it an opt-in feature, just the environment variables. If you want, you can enable it. We would include environment variables in your profile and then you're encouraged to um, filter the, the secrets out. Uh, another interesting, interesting thing is how do we even detect an execution? How do we know that something was executed? So the, um, the obvious, like the naive uh, thought would be to look into the system call that is invoking new executables. It's called execve. It's very commonly used in uh, tracing tools. Um, but we found out that it was not good for our use case for a few reasons. I would say categorically tracing system calls was a little bit problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that the system call 
is not really like invoking a function. It's more like the user requesting the system to do something. It's not necessarily what will end up being invoked. And now that we know that, um, th there are cases where the user might request to do something. And by the time that the system actually got to do it, the user might change the request. So we traced X, but the system invoked Y. So that is a kind of attack called uh, time of check, time of use, that um, for us as a security tool, we just didn't want to be in this position. Another problem with the uh, system calls and exec VE is that the user might pass arguments that are high level, because this is like an interface from the user to the system. So let's say I'm, I'm, I'm telling the system to invoke this binary, I'm giving it a path. That path may be relative to some other directory. That path might be a file descriptor that I opened and obtained earlier, and I don't know it. Uh, that path might be um, a symlink, for example, that the, sins, that the system needs to resolve. So if we were just tracing the exec VE calls, it might be that we were seeing meaningless information for us. We would see, for example, that file descriptor 5 was executed. What does it mean? No one knows, unless they had access to in the entire uh, capture of that uh, trace. So our solution was to switch and use uh, another uh, event that Tracy uh, produces. It's called the uh, sketch process exec. It's like an internal trace point in Linux. It solved all of those problems. Uh, it's not vulnerable to time of check, time of use. It, it uh, gives us the real path, how we call it, like the, the, the resolved path that is the absolute path to the file on the disk. Uh, it also gives us the hash and many more information that we include on that event. So that's another kind of uh, lesson that we took. All right, let's move on to uh, another uh, category of uh, things that we include, files being modified. Um, first of all, there's a bunch of signatures, same here, that look into suspicious file access patterns. For example, someone uh, changed the sudoers files on the system. Shouldn't happen, definitely not during the build. Uh, this is the kind of thing you get, again, in quotes for free, just by tracing being there. Uh, the profile also includes file being modified. Uh, and, and I mentioned this before, we want to limit this to only the, the GitHub workspace directory. We don't want any file that was touched. We just want the source code files that were touched. Touched. How do we know what is source code? We just say everything in the GitHub workspace directory. Um, again, here with the trigger, it was a little bit tricky. If you want to know when a file has been written to, then uh, the, the intuitive approach would be, okay, there's a system call for that. It's called write. If you trace write system call in your system, it's totally unmanageable because there's so many writes happening at any given point, especially on like on Unix, Linux, everything is a file, so basically uh, impossible to deal with. And um, it created a little bit of a challenge. Our solution to that was um, instead of tracing the, the actual writes to the files, we're tracing when a file has been opened for writing. So this is, this is an action that the, the program has to take. If, if you want to write to a file, you need first to open it, technically. This is how it works. Uh, and you need to pass the right flag. So this is what we capture instead. It's a nice trick. And um, we use it later on, again, like to, to, to trace the intent to do something and not necessarily the something itself, because uh, it's a lot more manageable. Another piece of, the, of this puzzle is network activity that uh, Tracy also uh, includes. Again, some signatures there. By the way, network is a relatively new uh, thing in Tracy. Uh, we have a very robust um, network tracing uh, capability that also includes protocol parsing. So this is unique kind of in the tracing world that you, you don't just trace accept system call, for example, and then you get gibberish. You actually, like you can trace HTTP calls, for example, and know that this process did an HTTP get to this um, IP, etc. 
And uh, what we would like to do here is to know which, uh, which web services my pipeline interacted with, right? This is, this is what we want to do. The problem is that there isn't a concept of a service in the network world. It's like it's a, it's a very high level concept, but in the in the low level network there isn't such a thing. There is just TCP to an IP, but we cannot even deal with IPs because IPs are also very dynamic. They will change for good reasons. Um, and uh, and again, um, touching back on the lesson from before that uh, instead of tracing the actual thing, sometimes it's easier to think about tracing the intent. In this case, if I want to communicate with another service, before I do that, I need to do a DNS resolution. This is like the file open from before. So if my pipeline communicated with an external service uh, using a domain name, we would catch that because there would be a domain resolution and we are catching domain resolutions, we give you a list of all the domains. If it didn't use a domain name, then this is something that we consider a suspicious behavior, like uh, contacting a bare IP, and there's a signature for that. Um, there's also like uh, other uh, network-related signatures, like someone uh, opened the reverse shell, like uh, trying to create a connection outbound that um, tunnels your shell to an external endpoint and stuff like that. There are a number of signatures. You can review them later in Tracy, but network activity is another section that was added to the GitHub action uh, of Tracy. Um, all right, and now, uh, after we understood that, uh, it was another kind of aha moment that I don't think we have yet uh, to fully understand it, but just wanted to share it even at this raw point, that we have a lot of good information at hand, right? We have executions profile, we have network activity, we have files being modified during the pipeline, a lot of good information. We use it in Tracy to tell you if something doesn't look right in your pipeline, but maybe you can use it for other purposes as well. Uh, specifically, there is the Salsa um, a specification that deals with, um, um, so they define it like, uh, they define a provenance uh, as uh, the verifiable information about software artifact describing where, when, and how something was produced. So we have a lot to add about the how something was produced, right? We know exactly how it was produced. So can we use this information in this context? And then we saw, um, not too long ago actually, that there is a proposal to create a format, attestation format. It's called a, a runtime a trace uh, that should complement the salsa uh, uh, predicate. And from that spec, I'm quoting, uh, the runtime trace can prove that the build was invoked via a script, that the build was executed in a hermetic environment with no access and so on. So this is exactly the kind of information that we already collect. And definitely uh, when this thing is, uh, is a little bit more matured, we would uh, emit uh, the, 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 the information in this format as well so that you can um, use it for other purposes like uh, complementing the salsa attestation. All right. So uh, we're at the end. This is like a recap of the lessons learned. Runtime is not a build time. We learned something there. Um, uh, we were able to increase the coverage by using signatures as a deny and profile as an allow kind of controls. We looked at how um, the blind spot of tracing tools, how we overcome them with the specific uh, features of Tracy. We talked about system call tracing as opposed to other approaches, what are the triggers, um, et cetera. And this is how you can um, look at all of this, actually. Tracy on GitHub or Tracy Action on GitHub. Um, and I'm here if you have any more questions. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference.